Well, sometimes in these little commentaries I talk about an issue not related in any way to the show you're about to see, but uh, this one, I think it's uh, worth describing what will happen here. The, the State of Catholicism, what a grand title for a show. Well, that doesn't mean we'll have various people in, in collars, bishops and clergy discussing what's going on in the church, but one man from the United States of America, a large country just to the, to the south of us, uh, who will talk about his particular view, version, analysis, perception of what is going on in the Catholic Church. Monolithic, well, to a degree, but uh, various opinions and voices within that church, a lot of people, more than a billion people. Uh, he has many fans, some people who oppose him. That means you're doing well when you actually rather what polarized uh, opinion out there. Going to be interesting stuff, whether you are a Catholic, a non-Catholic, an anti-Catholic, an atheist, or just bored and switching through the channels. It's great TV. Michael Coram, be my guest. Hello, welcome, Michael Corrin show, and uh, for those of you who are watching for a live show yesterday, ha ha, well, it, it snow. we had a little bit of snow in southern Ontario, and what a bunch of wimps they are, they, a snow day, I had people emailing me from other parts of the country, what is your problem, you know our problem, it's Toronto, soft, they vote liberal, they, no, no, no it, was, uh, it was quite bad snow in parts of, uh, of the province, and you, and you know when people say, oh, um, day off work today, I don't, forgive me, say, oh please, no, please, you must let me come to work, I don't do that for some reason, however, uh, business as usual now. Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, we have various shows, uh, uh, Faith Matters, uh, Arts and Culture, Federal Politics, Foreign Affairs, uh, or a one-on-one -on -one interview, if I think it's particularly worth it. Could be, I don't know, leader of the opposition, prime minister, Israeli prime minister, major leaders from around the world, or someone who has an, an extremely interesting take on something which is very important, in this case, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, you may not be Catholic, it's fine. You may be anti-Catholic, good fun. Don't have to be Catholic to watch this show or to enjoy this show. In fact, I'd be interested to see how, how all sorts of people react to it. Michael Voris is my guest, senior producer, realcatholictv.com. That's a website. It's not even a TV station. <laughs> how come you're so influential? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not sure how influential I am but, uh, or what we do at Real Catholic TV is, but uh, uh, I, I think we may have hit a nerve uh, yeah. with a, number of, uh, a good number of Catholics, actually, around the world. Uh, obviously, we're based in Detroit, so we have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of American following. But we have a, it actually kind of surprised us the amount of following we have around the world as well. How uh, many people? Uh, now, so, do, do you broadcast every day? Uh, yes, we we have uh, it, the website has uh, it, my background is TV TV news, so mm -hmm. I sort of built the site as a kind of a television news uh, or television station, mm -hmm. uh, and it has sort of two channels. It has a free channel that has news and commentary and that sort of thing on it, and then it has a whole bunch of uh, Catholic instruction, catechesis, yeah. apologetics, more theological stuff. And uh, because of that, uh, the the news and the commentary offering we make available every day, every weekday, right. so five days a week, and uh, it's. The, the, the number of those things have been downloaded. I think if I saw the YouTube numbers, the last YouTube numbers I saw correctly, in a couple of years we've had about five and a half million downloads of the... Five and a half million. Five and a half million. Downloads. Yes. Yes. We've uh, been blessed. That's <laughs> not bad at all. Uh, the broadcast all day or just a single half an hour or hour broadcast? Uh, no, it's, uh, it, it's not broadcast in the traditional sense of a broadcast, right. in the, but the beauty of the internet. You take yeah. the best of television broadcasting and mingle it with, uh, there are no time constraints no, no, either no. on either end, on length or uh, you know, uh, material, so uh, uh, we get to have the best of both worlds. So it's always available. Right. Uh, it's always online, so there is, a, there is a video archive sense to it. I see. But it's also fresh and new every day, so. And I'm still in shock. Five and a half million in, did you say two years? Two years, yes. So my math here, that's about just over two and a half million a year. Uh, about, yeah, about. As a matter of fact, we noticed in the last, uh, we don't really, we're, we're not numbers people, but yeah. occasionally you look, when you just see sort of a huge spike, you sort of go into the numbers and say, what's going on? Mm. So we look at the numbers, and in, in the month of January, we had, uh, January alone, we had about 350,000 downloads. I and mean, that was just shocking to us. We're like, since Christmas, we, right. wow, that's, that's really amazing, so. We're not yeah, sure what's behind it. I don't, we, I'm not, I don't, we don't gear for numbers. We gear for what we believe in. Mm. And apparently people just, you know, see it and respond. 
when it was announced that you were coming on the show, uh, now, uh, of course, there are many people who have no idea who you are, but those people who knew, it, it, it was a, a polarised reaction. Well, no, that's not fair. It wasn't polarised. There were many people who, who just ad adore you. They think what you say is wonderful, and we'll get to what you say in a few moments' time. There were, there were others who said, oh, I think he's really good. He's not always as kind as I'd like. <laughs> that, that means they want you to compromise more. And there are those who say, oh, dear, we don't like him. They tend to be people who have, I suppose, more authority in the Roman Catholic Church. And, and do you rock the boat? Well, it's not our intention to rock the boat. I mean, I, I, I think because of the sort of, uh, the, because of the material we talk about uh, and, uh, uh, and, and how we present it, uh, I think it tends to have a rock the boat effect, but it's not a rock the boat intention. All right. What is the intention? The intention is from a, uh, uh, to help people who are not Catholic come to understand what the Catholic Church teaches. Mm -hmm. For people who are Catholic but perhaps have been a victim, like I was, of horrible to no catechesis, no real good instruction in the faith, to have them realize that there's much more to being a Catholic than what they actually realize. Right. And for those who are strong in the faith but have been sort of beaten down or uh, oppressed, if you might want to call that, within the church because they have remained solid, they're kind of in theological terms what we would call the remnant, mm. uh, to give them uh, a sense of empowerment again. So to take everyone and kind of lift them up to the next tier right. uh, because, you know, it's our belief that, you know, without you know, getting into, you know, the deep theology is of it that, uh, uh, you know, the Catholic Church was established by Christ uh, for the salvation of souls, and that's the message that we want to push. How, how dare you claim, as a Catholic, that the Catholic <laughs> Church is correct? You're not meant to do that. We live in an age of ecumenism and liberalism and pluralism. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, we do. Hmm. <laughs> uh, but, but, but a lot to talk about. We're going to watch a video, though. Just, I mean, it's not a, a particular video. It's just an example of, of, of what Michael does, the work he does, and what we, we can see on his website. Let's take a look at that now, please. Hello everyone and welcome to the Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed, coming to you today, as you can tell, from St. Peter's Square, Vatican City. I had the privilege of being here for Pentecost Mass on, on Sunday, and I have to tell you, there was an enormous crowd here in the piazza. It was truly breathtaking to watch. The last time I was here was for uh, Pope John Paul II's funeral, and the crowd here rivaled that. Now, as we know, there's, the church has taken a lot of heat, particularly Benedict, for the uh, uh, sex abuse scandal that's been going on. Something that has been underreported in the mass media, however, is the growing support by the people who come here for the Sunday audiences with the Pope following the Mass. And if this is a signal of anything, it's a signal of how the Catholic world is now starting to come together. Mm. For those who are not part of the church, even for, for many who are part of it, the assumption would be that there's one voice in the Catholic Church and, and, uh, and when people go to a Catholic school they talk Catholicism or a Catholic university uh, they talk Catholicism and, and all the clergy uh, preach solid uh, <laughs> Catholicism which has not changed in thousands of years. Uh, the truth is a little different? The truth is a lot different, unfortunately. Uh, on your first point, there's one voice. Yes, that one voice uh, of authority is the magisterium of the church of which the Pope is the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the head. Uh, everything else you just said, uh, sorry, off the table. Mm -hmm. Welcome to... Uh, I, when you consider the fact that the church... If we have to understand what we mean when we say church, and yeah. there's a number of different understandings. You can talk about the church in the sense of, you know, the, the divinely established institution uh, that, that teaches the truths of, the, of Christ. You can talk about the church in the sense of her membership. You can talk about the church in the sense of, her, uh, of, of the hierarchy. There's a number of different ways we can understand church. But when we're talking about the church... Uh, and we say that, you know, these, that we've, it's fallen into error here, it's fallen into error there. Uh, not in the sense of its official teachings. Those the Catholic, Catholic Church believes and instructs are infallible teachings, the dogmas of the Church. Jesus is divine, Our Lady was assumed body and soul into heaven, Our Lord's present in the, real, in the Eucharist really, truly, substantially. Those are off the table. However, how you tell these truths and how you present these truths that you even present these truths has really uh, uh, sort of run across rocky ground in the last 40 or 50 years, sort of in the wake of Vatican II, not because of Vatican II, but in the wake of Vatican II, to numbers... About, uh, early, early 1960s on. Yeah, early, yeah, yeah, you'd say about the mid-1960s. And when you think of, that, uh, think of that in context of what was going on at the times, I mean, there's a great social upheaval. Yeah. 
And people in the church sitting in the pews are not exempt from that social upheaval going on. You have the introduction of, uh, you know, widespread contraception, the sexual revolution, uh, women's liberation, the anti-war stuff going on in the United States with Vietnam, the civil rights movement, all of these different things. It seems like, you know, for, you know, thousands of years, everything was fine and then everything became unhinged. And, uh, and then when you introduce into that great cultural milieu the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Second Vatican Council, there became kind of like a, oh, these are the halcyon days approach, even among the young clergy, the young clergy of the time, who thought the whole world is changing and so is the church and let's you know, rush to the barricades and we're going to tear apart everything we've known and reintroduce this whole brave new world. And uh, uh, there, I think it would be safe to say that there was a great deal of naivete in that approach. And as you look about the church today, 40 or 50 years later, you can see, yeah, the results of that mindset have been disastrous to the faith. Let's talk about Catholic education, because we, we have, in most of this country, a, a separate system which is funded, it's publicly funded, even though Catholics pay their taxes and, sure. and so on. Um, there are some wonderful Catholic teachers. Uh, well, the, most of the Catholic teachers are very good teachers. Mm -hmm. It's whether they're Catholic teachers, which, which, which is a question. Um, some of them are, but frequently, and, and I speak with direct experience and, and mm -hmm. plethora of conversations with people who've, who've been through the system. Sure. Frequently, it's a totally secular education. They know that the teachers are, are contracepting, they may be living together, may be gay. Mm -hmm. so again, it's entirely up to them, but if they call themselves Catholic, it becomes an issue. Sure. Uh, don't go to Mass, don't respect Catholic teaching. They're, they're teaching the kids to be good citizens, educated, but they're not teaching them to be good Catholics. Kids are coming out of, of high school after years of Catholic education. They couldn't define, they couldn't try to define Catholicism. They go to university, we have Catholic colleges and universities, as you do, yep. and if anything, um, they'll often hear anti-Catholicism. Sure. So, how did this, the, the, the great tradition of Catholic education uh, in, in many countries, Ireland, for example, the Catholic Church holding on to education right. for, for the people. How did it become so watered down, so diluted? I think the re the, what you've got to look at is you've got to go back to, you know, what was the, this exploded at the end of Vatican II into the 1960s and beyond. But there was, even before that, there was kind of a philosophical war going on uh, within the church. Now, it was not... It was, th that was not present to the people sitting in the pew. It was behind the scenes on sort of a higher up uh, academic level, a scholarly level. Uh, a lot of it began in the uh, 19th century, in the mid-19th century, and it sort of came out of the German, mostly Lutheran uh, school of biblical criticism, mm -hmm. historical biblical criticism, where the, where the validity and the truth of sacred scripture started being questioned. Well, did Jesus really rise from the dead, or are these gospel accounts just accounts of what people may have uh, experienced inside themselves? Was it fanciful thinking or mass hallucination? And they started bringing that mindset to bear on their study of Scripture. And what happened is things started becoming unraveled. And they became unraveled for about 50 years or so uh, and kind of coalesced in a movement that uh, uh, Pope Pius X at the time, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, termed modernism. And he wrote a large encyclical against this. And in this, in this encyclical that he wrote against modernism, he pinpointed all of these errors. And not only did he pinpoint them, he addressed them and answered them and then said, if these errors are not addressed, here is what is going to happen. And sure enough, for the next 50 years in the church, those battles, those kind of in the intellectual circles and the clubs and the scholarly journals, again, not really available to the people sitting in the pews, uh, all of this stuff was going on behind the scenes. Vatican II became a conduit, unintentionally, became a conduit for that thought to finally explode onto the scene where it did then translate to the people in the pews. So, for example, the, uh, you, know, you had Mass, Catholic Mass, where the priest always faced the same direction as the people, and it was generally, depending on 95% you know, of the time, it was to the east. Mm. Well, there was a reason for that, and there's a theology behind the reason why the priest faces the same direction as the people. Well, it's, even in the way that was presented, it stopped being called facing the same direction as the people, and it started being re-termed standing with his back to the people, because that's rude. You don't stand and with your back to someone, that's rude, so let's turn him around. And now we have this, uh, you know, this little gathering where we're all kind of in a community. Uh, it, it bespeaks a different type of theology. Uh, and uh, a number of people, there, there's a wonderful bishop, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, who is a uh, bishop in Kazakhstan, 
who was getting all kinds of noteworthy uh, press within the church. He uh, recently, a couple of weeks before Christmas, he addressed a large gathering of cardinals and bishops uh, in Rome uh, and directly addressed, uh, aimed his comments towards the Holy Father to Pope Benedict and said, these misinterpretations and, the, and misapplications of the teachings of Vatican II need to be addressed and need to be singled out in what the church calls a syllabus of errors, saying, as a re- not, be- not because of what Vatican II taught, but because of what it taught and how other people took it and misinterpreted it, and then took all of these misinterpretations and sort of foisted them on the church, on the people sitting in the pews. Vatican II never said a word about the, the altar turning around and the priest facing the people. Mm-hmm. It never said a word about ejecting Latin or Gregorian chant from the Mass. It never said a word about starting to receive Holy Communion in your hand versus on your tongue. It never, it never addressed those topics. But people inside the church who wanted, the, who had this agenda of their own to make the church more open, more this in their version, uh, took all of this and just started saying, oh, well, the spirit of Vatican II, we should right. do this, and the spirit of Vatican II, we should do that. So, so w- w- when it, it, I think it's said that where there is sufficient demand for the vernacular, English in, in, in Canada ma- mainly, mm-hmm. it should be provided. And right. what happened within, what, a year or two is, is you could barely find a Latin mass anywhere. That's and it wasn't ordinary Catholics saying, please, Father, we have to have mass in English, French or German. Right. It was generally a priest saying, you will now have it in that language. Correct. Okay, we'll break at that point. I love democracy. Back in a few moments on The Michael Corrin Show. Don't go away. Welcome back, Karin Show and, and uh, Michael Voris, senior producer. Well, he is realcatholictv.com, realcatholictv.com. There is, there are, I find this extraordinary. There are actually some, there are some people in, in the Catholic Church who would call themselves, I suppose, liberal, who in their liberalism said, this man should, is not welcome here. He shouldn't be... Um, ironic, is that the word we're looking for? A liberal, free speech, tolerance, pluralism, don't have to watch, don't have to listen. I don't agree with everything that, that he says, but I think he's a a dynamic and, and, and compelling voice. Uh, it's always seemed to me that in, in the church that there are people who call for democracy. We want, we want the people to speak more. What they actually mean is they want the church to behave the way they want it Correct. to behave. Correct. Because m- most people, certainly in the 60s, but even today, are actually more conservative than anything, aren't they? Yeah, mostly. I mean, certainly every poll that you see, certainly in the States, and I, th- I see this translated to a lesser degree in Canada, uh, that uh, people are generally more conservative. Now, you could argue over what do you actually mean by yeah. conservative, and, you know, are people counting themselves as conservative really kind of more on the fence? But whatever. The trends are all in Canada and the United States are much more towards the conservative bent. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the, the idea that people are... Um, uh, you know, it's kind of hell bent on liberal this, that, and the other. Uh, I I do think in many people's lives that's the truth. Mm. I do think in many people's lives that's the truth because you have to look at the culture that we're in. The air that you're breathing is is relativism, uh, is uh, a, a liberality of uh, of individualistic hedonism. And you can't just, you can't breathe this air forever and not have it begin to infect you. I, I mean, an example I always use is, uh, you know, an aquarium. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the fish are inside this aquarium and that's it. And if you keep introducing something little by little into the water, well, the fish are going to adapt to it. But eventually, at the end of a year or whatever period of time, the, what's going in and out of the fish is going to be this dirty water to the point that the fish don't even really realize it anymore. Mm. And uh, I do have to correct you on something, if you don't mind. Oh, please. You said, I am Real Catholic TV. No, no, I am not Real Catholic TV. There is an extraordinarily dedicated staff in the studio who work for peanuts, uh, who are uh, exceptionally dedicated to oh, the faith. Oh, stop it. So, goodness no, no, no. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Um, and very humble. But you, you are, I suppose, the, the, the main face of and, and, and voice of, yeah, I, I think. But I, your humility is... is, is, well, is it's, it's true. These guys work very hard. So It, it sounds banal, even crass, but I think a, a lot of uh, this so-called liberalism come, is about sex. Sure it is. We're not meant to say that, but people don't say, you know what, I really don't want to turn the other cheek. I disagree with the church. I, I, I really don't want to try and be nice to people. I, I, what they mean is, 
they want yeah, they to, want to contracept, cohabitate, commit exactly, adultery, get yeah. divorced and remarried. Uh, you know, have in vitro fertilization, have an abortion if the contraception fails. Yeah, yeah. So when the, the church says no to that, then they yeah. get upset. The church says, "Don't bomb Iraq." Maybe. Okay, oh, okay, yeah, I can yeah, live yeah, with that. Turn out in the streets by the hundreds of thousands <laughs> to support something that doesn't really impact and make a change in them. Yeah. But see, this is the this is the point of the church. The point of the church is not to be this big social help agency. It's to as an individual, it's to change you, to change me, to conform us to Christ. And Christ's message is be perfect. That's a high bar. Mm -hmm. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And, you know, it's, it, look, this shouldn't come as a shock for people going, oh, that's crazy, don't say that. The apostles said that. When Jesus said that, they went, well, who can be saved? And Jesus goes, well, you know, with, by yourselves it's impossible, but with God everything is possible. Yeah. So when the church preaches all of these different things, they're to conform the individual, to change the individual. No one likes change, particularly if you think you have to give up what you are enjoying at a particular time because... In the end, it's detrimental to you. Go to someone who is an alcoholic in the making, and you see he's an alcoholic, and everyone else knows he's an alcoholic, but he hasn't come to that realization yet, and tell me he has to give up his booze. Mm. And then if you say, oh, well, this guy in the, in the white gown over in Rome says you have to give it up also, ah, well, the heck with that. But you're right. As long as he says don't bomb Iraq, I'm, I'm right with him, because it doesn't affect me, really. But if I have to give up my alcohol or my sex or my, you know, lusting for money or lust... Oh, well, now I've got a problem with what you're telling me. And that's really what's the heart of all of this. There's a, a disconnect between uh, public or popular perception of the church and the reality, ac according to you, because yet another movie, Anthony Hopkins, great guy, you know, I think it's called Right, another movie. The Catholic I, I just church. saw it this past weekend. Any it's good? wonderful. Is Absolutely it? wonderful. Good stuff. I had lunch with Anthony Hopkins many years ago when he was playing Lear at the National Theatre. Lovely man. Yeah, he's... Anyway, that's a digression. <laughs> but, so all these movies about the Catholic Church... Um, a scandal or, or whatever, mm -hmm. the church is closed, terrible thing, things can happen, the teaching has never changed. It's got to change with the times. This pope is bad, that pope is bad. Yeah. We had the good pope, bad pope syndrome. John Paul was terrible when he was alive, according to the media. Yeah. When he died, Benedict is a bad guy, he, he was a good guy. Yeah. But you're saying, well, actually, at ground level, um, a lot of the, the, the teaching from, from Rome is perfect, but the teaching on the, on, on the basic level can be quite uh, relativistic. Sure. Compromising? Mm -hmm. Are you telling me that there, there are priests who, who will say to someone, it's okay if, if, if you're, uh, the abortion's fine? Sure. Living together is fine? I find that hard to believe. Oh, no, absolutely. No. I, if Surely you... a, minor, a small minority. No. No, and I don't know if it's a majority, but I would absolutely just, uh, uh, just from you know, my, my own personal experience, like you said, you've spoken to a plethora of people about Catholic education. I mean, I have also, but also spoken to people about all these issues. I'm sure you have. You know, obviously because of what we do. And, uh, you know, and I, we, we receive hundreds, hundreds of emails, uh, you know, weekly uh, in, into our studios. Uh, and the uh, people, good, solid Catholics, upset, you know, bothered troubled in spirit at the condition of what they see and hear going on in the church from the clergy. Bishops, priests, deacons, the things, the homilies they hear in homilies, the, the what is said and largely the what is not said and the kind of uh, cowardice or the, uh, the, the, the lack of zeal. You know, if you're going to, I don't think, I mean, I don't remember reading anywhere in, in any of the gospels that Jesus said, go out and be, you know, meek. Uh, and uh, when it comes to spreading the gospel, yeah. you go out there and be bold. I mean, he sent, you know, sent down the Holy Spirit. And what, what was the first thing Peter did uh, after Pentecost? Kicks open the door, goes out there and, you know, yells at all the Jews in Jerusalem, you crucified your Messiah. I mean, this is not politically correct. <laughs> the church is not politically correct, but it has unfortunately, the teachings of the church are not politically correct, but unfortunately, the presentation of them has become that Look, uh, for, in, in many, many cases. My experience has been that there was a time particularly, uh, I, I'm 52. Mm -hmm. I um, right behind you. Really? <laughs> Wasn't raised a Catholic, di didn't know the, the church at a certain time, but 20 years ago, certainly 25 years ago, when I, when I became involved in, in, in matters Catholic, there were, there were priests who, who were preaching something which didn't seem to be very Catholic to me. Correct, and there still are. Um, not even very Christian often. It seemed to be very, very politically motivated. Uh, there was a fear of offending. But I've seen a radical... Well, almost a transformation. Today, the, the young clergy I see, the, the, the new bishops, the new archbishops, 
they're a different breed. These are solid, orthodox Catholics who they understand the realities of life, mm -hmm. but they're not compromising on their teaching. No, I think that's true. I think as you, as you look at the landscape, the way it's developing, uh, I think there probably was a, I mean, if you sort of break it up into generations, you have this sort of the 60s generation of clergy, mm -hmm. you know, bishops and priests, obviously the bishops are, you know, 10, 15 years older than the clergy, but when you take a look at them and go from sort of the mid-60s to the mid-80s, uh, you know, this was a very, you know, in many, many respects, this crowd was off the reservation. Uh, they were preaching everything, uh, many of them were preaching all kinds of things that were just screwy. You couldn't reconcile, you can't reconcile liberation theology, which is, you know, Marxism dressed with a cross on the top of it. You can't preach that as something, and the Vatican had condemned, John Paul condemned it, Benedict's condemned it, it's just condemned. Uh, but a lot, but, but the major push on that was this sort of whole social justice thing, and, and there were a lot of people who saw the church, and this is clergy as well as lay people, leaders in the church, who wanted to fashion the church as sort of a giant social help agency, and a self-help kind of thing, and that theology stuff was fine, but it could sit on the sideline. What was important is the here and now, and feed the hungry, and as long as that's happening, that's all that you need to worry about. The, you know, Archbishop Fulton Sheen back in the 50s had a wonderful line he, uh, when it came to social justice. He said, Judas is the patron saint of social justice. It's, it's, a, it's a marvelous line because it, it wraps up everything in one slight little thing, one small phrase that says what it is. The, the, the whole social justice movement within the church is misinterpreted, misapplied, uh, and has been used as an excuse to kind of jettison mm. an awful lot of the solid theological teachings, which is the reason the church exists. Church does not exist to help the poor. Helping the poor flows from the theology of the church of why it exists. It's, an, it's, it's a consequence of it. It's not the goal. So you, you, you're not, I want to make this completely clear, you're, you're not saying that um, helping the poor is not an issue. You're not saying no. not being there for the marginalized. I mean, all these things are of vital, are. but it's a consequence of Christian belief. It, it's not the real. I mean, Christ didn't, he could have changed the world sure. just like that. He could have done anything he wanted to do. Right. Uh, belief in him, you have to then live a certain life. That's exactly it. But it's it's, means it's always ends. about personal conversion. You know, the, the word conversion comes from Latin conversio, which means yeah. to turn. And it's to turn away from sin and turn to God. And that is a daily thing that happens uh, if you're a believer in Christ. Do you fall? Sure. Do you commit sin? Sure. Do you pick yourself back up? Do you say, God, I'm sorry? Do you go to confession? Do you what you do? Do you get yourself back? And yeah, this is a constant working on And that's why, as you, I think, rightly nailed earlier, that you know, people don't want to go undergo this process. This is not a culture which says, be better. This is a culture which says, indulge yourself. And if you're going to indulge yourself, you're never going to be better. You just become more and more infantile, more immature, more spiritually disconnected. And we see the results of this all over, the, all over society, all over the Western world. We see this. So, you know, you have a pope like Benedict or John Paul who stands up and says, uh, you know, in John Paul's case, communism is horrible. But it isn't the only evil there is. You know, the evil, you know, the, the Gorbachev told uh, John Paul, uh, uh, we died, we, the communists, died in Russia because we had no soul. And that's a profound line, particularly coming from an atheist communist, that's mm. a profound awareness. And uh, I'm waiting for a leader in the West to make that same observation, that the West is, uh, who's not a pope, <laughs> the West is losing its soul. It's losing its soul. It's drowning in an ocean of nothing but self-absorption and self-gratification. And this is what the church stands there, like a rock, saying, you're destroying yourselves you're destroying yourselves. You, you know, in America, we, we've killed 56 million uh, uh, Americans under the age of 38 through abortion. Uh, you know, how many homes have been wrecked? Look, you know, look what's happened to the African-American community. The, uh, it, it, it's, been, it, it's been cannibalized uh, by many of its own. Uh, adoption of, you know, how you see the world, what your world view is, will dictate the choices you make in politics, in economics, in social dealings, in marriage, and then when you get down to your own self, you know, your own interpersonal relationships with people. Do you see this person you've just met as an object to go home and have sex with for the night? Or do you see this person as a child of God and treat them that way? That's the big division line that we have here, and that's why the church stands over here very countercultural. and for people in the church not to hammer this thought is wrong. This is the message of Christ, and they need to hammer that message. Do you know how many emails we're going to have out there? <laughs> <laughs> Brief hiatus, commercials, sort of materialism, but good, and then back to us. <laughs>
Welcome back to uh, Half Time, but there's only one guest, so I always reintroduce him. Michael Voris, <laughs> senior producer, realcatholictv.com. It'd be interesting to see how many hits you get uh, uh, after the show. Hopefully many. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, for, for my sake and yours. Why, and that's no, no names, please, but why are some people uncomfortable uncomfortable with you speaking, being in Canada, speaking, being on this show, speaking in, 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 in certain parishes and dioceses? I think that would depend on the different crowds that you look at sort of within the church. I mean, I would say that uh, uh, there are many people, and look, I understand this. I've had a reversion to the faith, and it took my mother getting cancer and dying. I'm sorry. To, uh, thank you very much. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it took her dying uh, and, and offering that suffering up. As a matter of fact, asking for that suffering, not specifically cancer, mm. but to, for our Lord to give her a cross to bring her two sons back to the faith. And uh, my brother had gone wayward on a different set of uh, circumstances also. Uh, and uh, so she offers this up. I come back to the faith. I understand the reluctance. I, Michael Voris, me, I understand the reluctance to want to change your life. I think most people who are immersed in, in a, uh, a self-absorbed, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, drugs, power, money, lust, sex, whatever, mm. you know, the distinction that modern man has a problem making is, is interposing joy and pleasure. Pleasure exhausts itself and it always needs more. Joy doesn't. Joy resides in the soul, pleasure resides in the body. That's good. And so the body always needs another shot of heroin or more sex or mm. whatever, you know, more material goods to, you know, to bathe itself in. And joy requires that you have an intimate relationship with God. And I understand to tear away from pleasure and orient yourself to joy, that conversio, that conversion we were talking about before mm. the break, that requires an awful lot of stepping up. Okay. You've got to man up and look in the mirror and go, wow, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm of kind course, of off base. But, but I, I'm, I'm speaking here of, of people who are... Who are who are Catholic of, of clergy? Oh, sure, absolutely. Hey, you know, the clergy aren't clergy aren't exempt from the joy pleasure. They, you're, we're born here. But they have a problem with you. I mean, they they find they don't like this saying. message. Well, I I don't think I, I can't imagine. And, and and any priest who would object to what you just said shouldn't be called a priest. I'm, I'm, I mean, I couldn't care less. Oh. But they would say they have other reasons. They would say, oh, he's lacking in charity. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. He, he, he's 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 judging people. He's he's naming certain bishops and, and exposing them to to ridicule. Um, well, you know what, if somebody's doing something wrong, uh, and the wrong, you know, goes over a vast, uh, a vast territory, mm -hmm. but if you're a baptized Catholic, you have a duty, baptized and confirmed Catholic, you have a duty to try to, uh, to try to help your fellow man, particularly your fellow Catholic, but anybody yeah. who's in a sense of trouble. For somebody to, uh, for somebody to withhold the truth that someone needs to change their lives is not being charitable. As a matter of fact, it's the least charitable thing you can do. You don't n see someone walking off the edge of the cliff and keep silent about it. You reach out and you grab them. And if in the reaching out grabbing them, you sort of disrupt them or you know, send them all a flutter or something, well then, oh well, too bad. You know what, you save them from falling off the edge of the cliff. And there is simply, uh, look, when Cardinal Lillet left, uh, uh, left Montreal to mm. go to uh, uh, to go to uh, the Vatican to be the head of the dicastery for bishops. He said, and this isn't me saying it, I'm just repeating it, he said, as a cardinal in the church, said uh, that uh, today too many bishops, not you and me, too many bishops simply are afraid to announce the truth of the gospel because they sit down first and, and, and consider what will the political ramifications be if they say this truth or this teaching. Now that's a cardinal, that's a prince of the church saying that. And uh, uh, I'm seconding that. I'm thirding it, I'm fourthing it. Absolutely. You know, I, I think the church has, uh, I, I think the church and the aspects of the church uh, have simply gotten too comfortable, too cozy with political power, social recognition, so all of this stuff. It is not the role of the church to blend into society. It is the role of the church to point out sin in society and bring people to Christ. And that means if you have to sacrifice yourself, your power, your prestige, your personal opinion, or the opinion people hold you in, too bad. Too bad. All right. I, there have been some bishops in the past uh, who I, I, I've been incredulous, actually, that they ever made it to be a bishop. <laughs> when I think today of some of the bishops I know, 
Uh, I know men who, who would give their lives, who would take a bullet, uh, a blade, they would give their lives for their faith and, and for their flock. Absolutely. There's a context of an abuse scandal. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a perception of the church, often very negative, a media waiting to jump on people. Sure. Surely some of these men are saying, yes, I'm trying to spread the gospel, uh, the truth of the church. At the same time, I have to be careful, not because I'm being politically correct, but if I say the wrong thing, it will damage the church. They're sure. doing it for the best reasons. Well, uh, some, for some people, that's absolutely true. No, I, for some of the bishops, I think that's absolutely true. Listen, we're in contact with a good number of uh, bishops who are... Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I have a number of them in my cell phone. <laughs> I can call them and just say, well, as a matter of fact, I did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, sometimes even sitting, you know, where I sit, which isn't some great high position in the church. It's just a unique position in the church, or right. it's mostly unique. And as I sit here and I think to myself, wow, this is horrible. And you, and you start to see sort of the string of horrors come in. Well, I'll pick up the phone and call, you know, a, you know, a, a, a number of bishops. I've, uh, you know, and say, hey, what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And I'll have nice conversations with them about it yeah. and, uh, and get great encouragement from them. I've had bishops look me in the face and say, I even as a bishop can't say what you say. Yes. Keep saying it. And, uh, and I've had a... And that's true. And that is true. That is true. And for the, some of the reasons you mentioned. Uh, but I think as we, look, as we look across sort of the episcopacy of the West, let's say, because this is true in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. It's probably even more disastrous in Europe. Uh, you know, there are some bishops who are very faithful and say what needs to be said uh, and let the chips fall where they may. There are other bishops who say what needs to be said uh, because, quite frankly, they're careerists and they just simply want to advance their cause of their career. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be a surprise. You know, go to the Gospels. The, the, the apostles were arguing amongst themselves which one was the greatest, and Jesus turned around and whipsawed on them and shut them up. Uh, there is another group of uh, bishops who simply don't believe some of these teachings of the church. And I don't think it's a question of they don't, th th that they're trying to prudently decide when to say it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think it would be naive to think out of thousands of bishops that some of them have not lost the faith. can actually point to one who came out and said that in Ireland. Uh, I, I can't remember his name right now, but he, was in, he came out and said, I haven't believed the teachings of the church for 25 years. This is a bishop. So you think to yourself, well, my goodness, all of the, what about in his 25 years, how many Catholics came in and went out of his care? What were they taught? Well, if he doesn't believe it, what's he exercising in his seminarians or what's he pushing for his priests to preach? So, you know, how is the faith lost there? And then there are people, I think the, the other sort of end of the spectrum uh, in these groupings uh, of bishops are the ones who not only don't believe it, but actively oppose it. Mm -hmm. uh, someone, for example, like Rembert Weekland, who was the Archbishop of Milwaukee openly, well, he, he's tried to keep it closed, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, homosexual, uh, active homosexual. He had a young lover for years who blackmailed him for a half million dollars. Now, in his retirement, he writes a book, the archbishop writes a book and says the church's teaching on homosexuality is wrong, and actually, the fact that I got blackmailed is the church's fault, because if it saw the light and got it, got with the program, they wouldn't have this teaching, and I wouldn't have been able to be blackmailed. And it's even worse than that, because the, the use of, of money, of, of, sure. of public money, people paid the money, and it was yeah. used by this man, yeah. but he's quoted in media, media will quote yeah. this man as, as a voice of moderation. Yeah, well, they'll go after the same thing with, uh, you know, Richard McBride at Notre Dame. Uh, Richard McBride has been a disaster for the faith. I went to Notre Dame. I went there when he was there in his heyday and producing he's all his the, books. The president? He's no. He is the um, uh, well. He was chairman of the theology department right. at Notre Dame, but someone who openly disagreed with it. The textbook that he produced got slammed. It's called Catholicism. It's about this thick, mm -hmm. and it's essentially Richard McBride's opinions about Catholicism, and uh, uh, we know where need be the case. And uh, that book got slammed by the American bishops. The, the bishops themselves wrote a, wrote a censure. Said, so, yeah, well, I mean, first of all, if you're getting censured for being too liberal by the American bishops, I think that says something right out of the gate. Uh, as there a, are some great new bishops as, as a body, as a body, as a body. And uh, uh, but you know, he he still teaches from this book. He teaches from. He doesn't care. But you know, has he been censured, or you know, are there are there secret emails flying around from one bishop or diocese to another saying, "Oh, don't let Richard McBride come talk here." You know, every time the media comes around, uh, you know, he for the only time in his in existence, he slaps on his collar and sits there and talks as though he's the voice of authority. What people don't understand is what has been set up in in the West are competing magisteriums, competing voices of authority within the church. And there is the 2,000-year-old magisterium of the church uh, with Peter, the Pope, at its head. 
Over here is another magisterium of theologians and errant bishops and clergy who simply will not, you know, obey the teachings of the church for whatever reason. Their own personal moral failings, they just don't agree with them intellectually, they, they, they you know, now's not the time, whatever, that crowd. And, 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 they, and they quietly subvert and undermine the actual magisterium of the church. Okay. This is the group that every faithful Catholic should have a problem right. with, not this one. We've got one more segment going, going to break. Just before we do, on a note of optimism, I do agree with you on, on the, the, the dual magisterium, if you like. Yeah. Surely the balance has tipped in the past generation. Rome is far more influential, far more respected now than it, than it was. That alternative magisterium, its newspapers are closing, its yeah. colleges are declining, it's not producing clergy anymore. Mm -hmm. They're very unhappy. The, the good guys are winning, aren't <laughs> yeah. they? The good guys are winning, but, the, but now the good guys need the encouragement. Okay. Now they need the encouragement. Now is the time for bishops to say, ah, you know what, we do need to step right. up and say here, because there's a whole generation okay. here lost. Notice how it, encouragement. Interesting. A uh, few moments, we're back. See you very, very, very soon. If you'd like to contact The Michael Korn Show, please write to The Michael Korn Show at 1295 North Service Road, Burlington, Ontario. L7R 4X5 or send an email to michaelcorn at ctstv.com. If you'd like to learn more about CTS, visit our website at ctstv.com. So, so I was coming in to, to, to do this interview and uh, Mike, who works with, uh, with me here on the show, he, he got this, uh, this article that said that the Pope had said conservative Catholic bloggers, you've got to be charitable in what you say. And I went through and it seemed to me that what the Pope actually said was when it comes to the internet and Twitter and Blackberries, I've just got one by the way, and, and <laughs> it's all terrific, but make sure that personal relationships come first because otherwise it's all vicarious. It, it's all, you, you, you're looking at this or at a screen. Make sure you have loving relationships with, with people, with human beings. That's all he said. It was fine. And uh, then someone else maybe had some influence and get him to criticize conservative Catholic bloggers. You're, you're a lead, you're one of many. There are some bloggers out there who are acid. They say things which yeah. are completely lacking in charity and understanding, sure. uh, and they do a great deal of harm. Mm -hmm. I haven't really seen that in what you've had to offer. Well, I suppose that depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have your moments, but... Yeah, there are... Uh, no, ours... Uh, we are very mindful of the, uh, of the idea of being charitable. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some people who criticize us are probably falling off their chair laughing when, when they hear me say that. But we're very mindful of that. But the, 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 the problem is the question of charity. What mm. is charity? Many people have kind of evacuated or vacuumed out the meaning of charity and substituted it with social politeness, being mm -hmm. nice. That's not charity. It is not charitable to allow someone to go to hell because you're too afraid to step up and say what needs to be said in their lives. Uh, uh, you know, our Lord was charitable. Our Lord was charitable when he was yelling, you know, at the Pharisees, you know, woe to you, you hypocrites. And it, our Lord was being charitable when he took the whip and drove the money changers out of the temple well, and turned over the tables. Have you been personally criticized by the Pope? Uh, not that I know of. Right. <laughs> what, was he, what, what, what was he allegedly talking about? This reference to or the statement that, that came out of the Vatican about bloggers and being charitable. What did it, what did it mean? Well, you nailed it. I mean, the, the statement itself, uh, uh, the, the Pope had said, was just that. He was concerned that, he was concerned that the, the, uh, a lack of charity would develop. Uh, in interpersonal relationships because mm -hmm. interpersonal relationships are being replaced by virtual relationships. I mean, how many friends do you have on Facebook? 6,247 of my closest intimate friends. Well, it cuts uh, you it, off at 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me. Yeah, sure. But it's, uh, <laughs> but that's what the Pope's comments were aimed at. That, yeah. you know, that, that, you know, we need to develop a sense of community and all that. And the internet is, is wonder, is a wonderful tool for that, but it's not the end. Right. Uh, so having taken that statement where he just stepped into the question of, um, where he just stepped into the topic of the internet, uh, other people uh, in the Vatican, as they were kind of explaining, because this happens a lot, the Pope says something and then someone else has to explain what the Pope means. Uh, because, you know, the Pope can't be understood for his own words. <laughs> Somebody has to interpret it for you. Um, someone else took it and interpreted it, and a, and a reporter said, a reporter asked a question which gave the... Uh, 
uh, the uh, person who answered the opportunity to kind of go off on you know conservative you know bloggers and that sort of thing. So, um, but no, there is a sense that, uh, and, and it would be undeniable and dishonest to say that uh, there is not a sense in the church that um, among church leadership right now that uh, that things are a mess. They need fixing. The voices from faithful. Catholics, and by faithful Catholics, I mean they go to Mass, they participate in the sacraments of confession, they go to the, obviously they receive Holy Communion at Mass. Uh, they believe everything the Church teaches about contraception, abortion, uh, the, the dogmas of the Blessed Mother, the, the real presence of Christ. That's a faithful Catholic. And that crowd is sick to death of being dumped on, relegated to the to Catholic ghettos and dioceses and parishes, being scoffed at, uh, carried on as though there's some kind of lunatic fringe. They're sick to death of it. And now the internet has given those people an opportunity to begin finding each other. Because up to this point in the last 40 or 50 years, there have been isolated pockets of these. And we get tons of emails from people who say, uh, thank goodness I found you. Thank goodness I found this site or that site. We finally have the opportunity now to feel like we are not alone. And that's what the internet is doing. It's pulling these folks together. These folks are finding voices from different organizations and different presence on the website, different websites. And, uh, uh, and, and they're coalescing. And that's what's happening, and they're coalescing, and these are the faithful Catholics, like we just defined faithful, who said we're sick of the garbage going on, fix it. Whether the garbage is errant priest, horrible preaching, you know, uh, you know, uh, lacklustered cowardice on the part of some bishops, uh, you know, the sex abuse scandal, the whatever it is. I mean, the list is endless, okay. almost endless. Those people are finding a voice, and that's what's unnerving many people who are comfortable sitting back just sort of letting the status quo exist. All they right. don't like the status quo being challenged. Let's give you a plug here. Uh, Kitchener, Ontario, lovely town, Kitchener. Um, I think we're going to put it up on the screen too. Saturday, March the 19th, um, that's in, well, a few weeks. Uh, Croatian Hall in Kitchener, and uh, there's a, a, I think the email address is coming up on the screen, isn't it? But, um, so, March the 19th, you're coming to speak. Mm -hmm. It won't be boycotted by any woman, it may be, but that doesn't really matter, <laughs> does it? Um, it, it's, it's extraordinarily interesting, and um, uh, we'll have to have you back to answer the, the emails that are going to be sent in in their, in their thousands. Uh, let's read one of those emails, not about you, right now. Tanya Nisa, Toronto, Ontario. Uh, thank you so very much for last night's show. There was a repeat because of the snow, but uh, finally the public hears from the panel about the plight of persecuted Christians. Thank you for providing a voice for the suffering and the martyrs, and may the Lord uh, bless you richly for it. Tanya, I have to say, um, one of my concerns about Egypt and I hope I'm wrong, is that uh, Christians in Egypt will, will, will face future inst worse instability, because 